Hello, and welcome to Greece Public Library's book break for July 30th. Um, I'm Kirstra. I'm one of the librarians here. I moderate the Pints and Prose book discussion group and the virtual science fiction and fantasy book discussion group. And as always, I am joined by my colleague, Claire. Hi, I'm Claire. I do the As the Page Turns and also our historical fiction book group on Facebook. So mm -hmm. welcome to book break. Yay. Um, I don't think we have a theme today. I've just got sort of three random books that I've read recently. What about you? Oh, pretty much the same. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Except I do. I do. I oh. think mine are all debuts. But Oh, all right. But I didn't intend for a theme. So nice. Okay. Mine are not on a theme. <laughs> yeah. At all. <laughs> um, do you want to start or do you want me to start? I'll start. Okay. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is actually one for my book groups. It's, I, I have the paper because I'm doing it, of course, on Hoopla, but it's called The Mountain Sing. Um, I think it's Nugan Fan K Mai. I'm going to hopefully hope I didn't butcher that. Um, but if you like family sagas and historical hmm. fiction, um, this book has been compared to Pachinko, which has been on my list for quite some time, and I have not Mine read. Mine too. Um, yeah. But I've, yeah, I think you'll love The Mountain Sing. Um, this is how a family from North Vietnam has coped with loss, sadness, and some joy um, during the years before and after the Vietnam War. It's told from the perspective of two characters. Um, the first is the grandmother, who is Du Lan. She was born in 1920, and so you go through what French colonization of Vietnam is like. Her family was a fairly wealthy landowner, I would say. Um, and the way she describes the food they eat and the beautiful carved, I could just picture like where mm -hmm. she lived in the village and, you know, and, um, and then what happened to them when, um, you know, the, the communists came in and landowners' land was seized. So mm -hmm. you're getting quite the history from her viewpoint. And then also she is the guardian of her granddaughter, um, Hong. And Hong is born in 1960. So hers is more the story of the division of North and South Vietnam, the Vietnam War itself. Um, both her parents are missing. As of present, um, her father went to fight. Her mother, who was a doctor, actually went to look for her father. Um, and then aunts and uncles and cousins and how they're all affected. Um, so Dulan was such an interesting character because she is the family matriarch. Um, she's lost her father, her brother, her eldest son, and her husband, all due to war or occupation. And um, she shows incredible strength she starts trading on the, she becomes a black market trader because she's literally lost everything. And she has to figure out a way to survive. And you start to see things differently just because of that. And I just admired her grit and integrity. And just as a, you know, a woman taking charge, it was like, you go grandma, you know? <laughs> um, and she also introduced her granddaughter to Western fiction. Um, mm -hmm. So some of the things that she traded for were, um, you know, Western books that her granddaughter could read and to hopefully get a different perspective. And one of the quotes was, is that um, she starts telling the story of her family to her granddaughter so she could better understand where they came from, um, is that if history is forgotten and history is not spoken, um, you can't do anything better in the future. And it, it was just, I don't know, I love the whole book. Um, so you get to experience a lot about Vietnam as a country. And also with Huang, um, she finds her first love. You know, when her grandmother becomes a traitor, a lot of her friends ostracize her, even though they accept her money to get fresh water for the village. Um, right. But anyway, it was, it was just eye-opening. It really made me see Vietnam in a whole new way. Um, I love the book. Highly recommend. And Thanks. if you want to talk about it with me, <laughs> come to Facebook next Tuesday at six o'clock and we'll be talking about the mountains thing. So 
Very cool. Yeah, I'm going to have to put that one on my list. It sounds really interesting. Yeah, it was really good. Nice. Um, okay, so my first book, so I have two books that I really liked and one book that I was kind of lukewarm about, and I'm going to start with the lukewarm book. But I, so that one is Akin by Emma Donahue. Um, Emma Donahue uh, is most known for writing Room, um, mm -hmm. the novel that the movie was based on. Um, I haven't read Room, but I did read The Wonder, which is another one of her books, which I really, really liked. Um, so I saw she had a new book and I picked it up. I was like, ooh, I'm going to like this book. I didn't love it. Um, so the setup for this book is um, our main character is Noah Salvaggio. He is almost 80. He's a widower. He's living alone in his apartment in New York City. He's a retired chemistry professor. Um, and he is um, about to leave for a trip to Nice, which is where he was born in 1940. So right before World War II began, um, his family lived in Nice. His grandfather was a famous photographer and his mother was his grandfather's assistant, essentially, in the photography business. Um, so war breaks out. Um, his father leaves for New York to get away from France. Um, his mother stays on um, and then eventually sends Noah on. When he is four years old, she sends him on a ship alone to New York. Oh, to wow. United with his father. Um, and she stays in France for another four years and never really talks about what happened during that time. Um, so Noah has not been back to Nice since he left at four years old, um, but he's got, you know, these tickets booked. It's sort of um, his sister, we find out, has passed just a year or two before, and she left him some money with the um, stipulation that he use it for something fun. So he decides to take this trip to France. So he's getting ready to leave and he gets a call because his um, sister's grandson, so his great nephew, um, is about to be placed into the foster care system. His uh, father, who is Noah's nephew, has passed. Um, his the boy's mother um, is incarcerated, and the boy who has been living with his grandmother from the other side of the family um, has just passed. So there's no one to sort of take in the young boy. He's nine years old. Um, so a social worker contacts Noah and says, you know, can you take this boy? And so that's sort of the setup. Um, Noah is initially very resistant. He never had any children. He's not particularly comfortable with children and he doesn't he doesn't have an existing relationship with Michael um, but he you know it's an emergency situation he ends up taking him and somehow and this is the first thing that I was like I'm not sure that this would actually happen um, manages to like get a passport for Michael in like two days and takes him with him on this trip to Nice sure wouldn't have happened for me I can tell you that right now Right? Um, so, I mean, the alternative was that Michael goes into the foster care system, which, you know, but like, just the, from a bureaucratic aspect, it was like, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so they go on this trip to Nice, um, and while they're there, uh, the part of the book that I did like was Noah sort of um, revisiting this place that is really only half remembered from the very beginning of his childhood and sort of re-exploring and, um, you know, kind of rediscovering Nice as a, as a new place, as an adult. Um, so that was really cool. Um, he, Noah also has um, a small collection of photographs that his mother took. They're all unlabeled, but they, they were clearly taken in Nice. Um, and there's sort of a, a little bit of a mystery about what these photographs mean, what they're for, why she kept them, and what happened to his mother during her time in France during the occupation. Um, so that part of the book 
I found really interesting. Um, I had a much harder time with the relationship between Noah and Michael. Um, I didn't find Michael particularly believable as a nine-year-old boy from Brooklyn. Um, and, you know, the, the author is, um, she's Irish. She lived for a while in Nice, which is probably why um, she's able to write about that area um, so well. But the stuff from New York and sort of the what is an American nine-year-old boy like didn't really work for me. Um, yeah. So, like I said, I came down kind of lukewarm on this one. Um, you can probably already guess how the, like, Michael and Noah relationship is going to end up. I'm not going to spoil it, but it's not exactly a surprise. <laughs> um, but he does discover more about um, what happened to his mother during the war, and you get sort of a a better picture of what occupied France actually looked like during World War II. So again, hot and cold, I looked um, on Goodreads at some of the reviews and almost everybody gave this book five stars. So your mileage may vary. <laughs> um, I didn't love it, but um, I'm not sad that I read it. Um, so it's one of those I think I'd be interested to talk to other people about to see what they think. Okay. I have a lot of those kind of books lately. Mm -hmm. You know, where it's yeah. just like, yeah, not bad, you know, but mm -hmm. not my not my favorite, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So all right. So my next one is totally on a different line, <laughs> you know, not historical fiction, but mm -hmm. indulging my farm life of the rural <laughs> diaries, okay? And the funny thing about me reading this, this is Hillary Burton Morgan. Hillary Burton Morgan, I guess, was in a number of TV shows. I'd never heard of her, okay? But I don't watch much TV. Um, One Tree Hill. Mm. Uh, trying to think of some of the other ones that she said. Oh, Grey's Anatomy, Lethal Weapon, okay? Her husband is Jeffrey Dean Morgan mm -hmm. from The Walking Dead, and I believe Supernatural. And also and Grey's Anatomy. Anatomy. Yeah. yeah, they work together. So, um, you know, two fairly famous people that Claire does not know. Um, <laughs> but I devoured this book in one sitting. I, wow. She just writes so, like, I felt like I knew her, even though I don't. Um, and just, uh, it's more like a conversation with a good friend uh, where you learn how they met and then how they're trying to juggle their jobs and they're really not drawn to that. Um, she knows early on that she is not drawn to the Hollywood life. Mm -hmm. um, when she worked on One Tree Hill, she bought a house in North Carolina. So there's the link for Claire, you know, um, which might have been haunted. Um, she loves like doing stuff with her hands, mm -hmm. gardening, um, very much a real person in that mm -hmm. respect. Um, so their first thing they do together is they rent this cabin in upstate New York that is not in great shape um, and they kind of rehab and refurbish it because they want a place to get away they want mm -hmm. to get away from that madness and then um, they're still not married but she gets pregnant um, they have the baby that just adds to their their family you know they're wanting to really get more from the land type of thing. Um, so they find this farm called Mischief Farm, and it's not far from the town where they are, and they decide to, to buy it and really invest in it. They become very vested in the town that it's in. Can I think of what town that is right now? No. Probably not. Uh, Rhinebeck, <laughs> Rhinebeck, New okay. York. Okay. Oh, sure. So they... Um, they make friends with the people in the town. There is a place for kind of wayward or abused children. And Hillary gets on the board. She becomes vested in fundraising for this place. So it's not like it's just two Hollywood people that mm -hmm. chose to like grace this town. They, they really live there and really want to make a, a, a spot for themselves in the community in a positive way. Mm -hmm. um, 
Oh, it's called Astor House. That's where she is. So they gradually start accumulating animals, chickens, donkeys, alpacas, <laughs> cows. Um, and then you also read about her struggle, like she wants another child. And it's like her first one was just like that. And as many people know, you know, it may not happen that way the second time. And it doesn't for her. So um, she kind of shares that with you too. So and maybe that's what makes her more real is not everything is happy, happy, happy all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I just loved reading about how they transformed the places like her brother came, you know, she talks about what they worked on, how they did it. Um, she shares recipes too, which a lot of memoirs do, but she shares some of her recipes in the book. Um, so I really, I really was surprised at how much I like this book considering I didn't know who either one of these people were. So, <laughs> but if you like that farm kind of memoir type mm -hmm. thing, want something that's set fairly local, it's like, I really want to visit this town now after, after COVID yeah. because they have a Santa Claus festival and they you know, have they a huge a, sheep and wool festival too. Ever. Yeah. They had a teddy bear like beauty contest where the candy <laughs> store owner, oh, that was another thing. They had a, a candy store owner they got to be friends with and then he passed away unexpectedly and found out that the store was really floundering so they bought the store and invested in it and tried to keep it going for the community mm -hmm. you know not just like a, a superficial thing right um, they tried to figure out what worked what didn't you know how to keep cool. it thriving how to keep that community thriving so mm -hmm. yeah, i really i really like the book so nice very yeah. cool Celebrity memoir for the win. Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> Love livestock and big life lessons down nice. on the farm. Okay. So, right in a day. <laughs> Very cool. Nice. Um, so my second book is also a little different. Um, so this one I don't have a picture of because my copy was due back. And as soon as I returned it, somebody checked it out. So <laughs> I don't have a physical copy. Um, and I didn't think to print a picture like Claire did. But my book is uh, Swimming Lessons by Claire Fuller. Um, and I liked this book a lot. It's um, so there are two sort of interlocking stories. So we've got the story of Flora, um, who is in her early 20s. She's um, an artist or struggling to be an artist. Um, and at the beginning of the book, um, her father ends up in the hospital. So she sort of takes off to see what's happened. She has an older sister um, who also shows up that she has kind of a tricky relationship with. Um, and we find out the other sort of story that we get pieced through is of her mother and her father. So her mother is Ingrid. Um, she is, um, she's studying in the UK. She's from Sweden. Um, and she falls in love with Gil, who is a famous writer and also happens to be her writing professor. Um, oh. indeed. So yeah. there's some, some drama there. Um, but Ingrid is, um, when we meet her, she's writing a series of letters to Gil, um, sort of about their relationship and their history and her side of um, some conflict that they have had. Um, and each letter she writes, she hides in one of the books in the library of their house. Um, so we get sort of snapshots of Ingrid and Gill's relationship from the very beginning to their present, um, which is um, right before Ingrid disappears. Um, so Flora's story happens 12 years post disappearance. Um, and everyone assumes, um, Ingrid likes to swim in the ocean. Everyone assumes she went for a swim, got into trouble and drowns. Um, and Flora is the only person who believes that her mother is still alive somewhere out there. So, um, there's not a lot of like conflict in the book. There's not a lot of plot. Um, we are learning more about Gil and Ingrid's relationship. And then we also see Flora as an adult 
kind of trying to make sense of and re-understand things that happened when she was small. So we have Ingrid's side of sort of their family life, and we then we get Flora's remembrance of some of that, which um, she realizes that she has to sort of evolve her understanding of those grown-up relationships around her, which is, you know, a very real thing. Things that you think you remembered from when you were a kid, um, you know, your parents often are like, yeah, that didn't, <laughs> that didn't happen that way. Or there was a lot of other stuff going on that she didn't know about. Um, so it's really kind of an exploration of, you know, memory and relationships and the way, like, different people on different sides of relationships understand things differently or have different perspectives. Um, and love between parents and between family members. Um, so it's, it's kind of sad in places, but it's a very sweet book. Um, like it, you end up feeling, um, you know, even if people made bad decisions, um, that there was real love within this family. Um, and you just feel a little sad that they didn't figure out kind of a better way to express it to each other and to be with each other. Um, yeah, so is different than a lot of stuff I tend to read. Like, again, there's not a huge amount of plot, um, but I really liked it. It was um, a very kind of mellow read, um, but ultimately um, positive, you know, just kind of a nice read. It's funny because I'm reading one right now about someone that disappears. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and it's kind of the same where you start to see this person through different eyes of mm -hmm. the family and realize that they're not what they they seemed, you mm -hmm. know, on the surface. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That sounds good. Yeah, it was good. I really liked it. Okay. So my last one. Um, I believe is another debut, and it is a teen book, and it's mm. called American Street by Ibi Zolb Zolboy. Um, I should have picked easier names. Uh, <laughs> but this one was uh, brought to my attention because, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. I really want to kind of diversify my reading a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, and since I buy teen books, I really like to read them sometimes just to see what's what's going on with teen literature. Sure. This one was um, really interesting because it's about uh, a Haitian girl and her mother that want to immigrate to the United States. Um, the mother's sister lives in Detroit. So when they come to the airport, mom is detained um, mm -hmm. for paperwork or some other reason. And the daughter, who is a teenager, goes on to Detroit by herself. Um, so Fabiola is the young girl. Um, and it was just remarkable to me because you have this whole culture difference um, between Fabiola, who's been raised in Haiti, and her aunt and cousins who have been raised in Detroit. So all these very unique characters um, and the, the aunt has been sending money to keep Fabiola in school, which she's very grateful for. But what she didn't realize is the way the aunt earned the money. Um, and once their family starts to unfold, like um, it looks like auntie is a loan shark. Um, the two daughters are trying to pay back some money that they borrowed. So they're delving into illegal things. So Fabiola is kind of torn because she's, beginning to grow and love this family who has done so much for her, mm -hmm. but yet she's also trying to reconcile, like, how do I do the right thing? Um, Cause some of the characters that the sisters come into contact in particular, the, there's a set of twins, Prima Donna and princess. And Prima Donna has a, a boyfriend that is just not, not good. He um, is abusive. Um, they think he's a drug dealer. 
and just the relationship there. So she's trying to figure that out. But meanwhile, she meets one of his friends who is a really good guy um, that she starts to get involved with. So there's a lot of things going up. It's a great coming of age story. It's a great story of immigration because, you know, how you begin to see how people are affected when one family member, like a parent, is not able to go with a child um, and how the child is affected and is trying to make these decisions on what they should or shouldn't do. And they don't have guidance. Like when she first got there, um, she had to fix her own meals or whatever. They were all busy, you know, was like, yeah, we got you here. This is great, you know, when you're going to be enrolled in school. And, you know, so meanwhile, she started to cook and clean and do things, um, you know, so it was, it was really interesting. Um, the other twin princess is also um, gay and has a, a, you know, she's actually pining for the love of uh, a girl that she knows, but she doesn't really want to come out and say she is. Um, so that was another interesting part. You have these two twins that are so totally different. Um, and she feels that she has to be the protector of the family because the father was shot and killed long ago. Mm -hmm. Um, so if there's any fighting or anything that needs to be done, it's Princess, who calls herself Prin, <laughs> that does the beatdown for everyone. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, it was just uh, quite the cast of characters and just really interesting. And it was interesting to learn about the Haitian ways as well. And the mm -hmm. author is Haitian. Um, okay. So yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. And I went through this one pretty quickly too, because I really after the tension starts to build where Fabiola is trying to devise a way to get her mother in the country mm. and she meets up with a detective. Okay. So I don't want to say too much more. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's almost like a deal is being brought, like you give me this and I'll get your mother, you know, and they entice her with being able to call her mm. mother. So that's why she's torn between her new family, trying to get her mother and what should she do? So that's like the crux of the problem in the book. So I don't want to give nice. too much away, but yeah, there are a lot of sad parts. So I'll, I'll put that out there. But. Well, that sounds really good too. Yeah. I like reading teen books too sometimes. Yeah. Um, I find they're quicker, mm -hmm. uh, but there is a lot of substance to them now. They're not just like, some of them are light and fluffy, but, but mm -hmm. like this particular one and Angie Thomas and Jason yeah. Reynolds. They are not light and fluffy novels. Right. No. But they're dealing with stuff that's happening right now. Correct. Yep. Which I like. Me too. So I had a two kind of present day, which is very unusual for me. And mm -hmm. you know, my my historical fiction. All good. Yes. I'll I'll recommend. Very cool. Yeah. Um so my third book I've got the audio version here is The Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead. Um, this one has been on my list for a while. I read his book Underground Railroad um, a couple of years ago and loved it. Um, and this one actually is the winner of the 2020 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, which I didn't realize until I was just pulling some information on it. Wow. So did he win it twice? Uh, I don't know. I thought Underground Railroad was something. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, no, it did. It did. It won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. So okay. uh, Colson Whitehead knows what he's doing. Uh, <laughs> he is hot. Hot right now. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, so Nickel Boys or The Nickel Boys is the story of Elwood, um, Elwood Curtis. Um, he is a young man growing up in the 1960s in Tallahassee. He is black. Um, he lives with his grandmother. His parents have um, essentially just left him with his grandma to go off and live their own lives elsewhere. Um, so he's being raised by his grandmother. He is um, a great student. He's about to take, um, start taking some college classes. He's still in high school. Um, and this is happening during the 1960s, during the Civil Rights Movement. So... Um, his grandmother is very strict. He's not allowed to listen to popular music, but she found a record for him of uh, Martin Luther King's speeches that he listens to. So he's been listening to these speeches. He has a couple of teachers who are involved in the civil rights movement. So he's starting to sort of 
um, get an understanding of um, the civil rights movement and um, protesting. So he starts joining protests um, and we see like just such a bright future for Elwood. Um, and on his way to his first day of college classes, um, something happens. It's uh, sort of a wrong place, wrong time scenario. And he ends up being sent to what is essentially reform school. So um, he's, he's arrested and his sentence is um, like 14 months at the Nickel Academy. Um, so the Nickel Academy uh, is an institution for the physical, intellectual, and moral training of young men. Um, but it's, it's juvie, like it's a reform school. Oh, um, cool. There are um, white kids and black kids there. Um, they live in segregated accommodation, um, but have much of the same experiences while we're there. So most of the book takes place um, during Elwood's time at Nickel. Um, he makes a friend named Turner. Um, they sort of look out for each other. Turner um, has been in Nickel before, um, so kind of knows the ropes and is able to help kind of guide Elwood through his time at Nickel. Um, and there are some parts of this book that are tough. Um, there is just a horrific amount of abuse and neglect that goes on at Nickel. Um, and it's all presented just very matter of factly, which in some ways kind of makes it worse because everyone just accepts that like, this is the way it is. Um, you know, the, there are some guards that kind of just don't care. And there are some guards that are like actively predatory towards oh. these boys. Yeah, it's, it's not great, but you also see, um, like, you get mostly the effects on the kids of being in this situation. Um, we learn about a lot of the different kids and why they ended up at Nickel, um, and most of them aren't, you know, just inherently, like, evil people. They're in these tough situations with very few choices and those the choices that they do have end up sort of funneling them towards nickel and once they've been through nickel you know it's um it's like we see today in prisons um there's you know recidivism so a lot of the kids who get out end up being sent back um, because they have no support system outside of nickel um, so we see how being in that environment um, really affects them and their personalities and changes them. Um, and Elwood, like his whole time there is, is struggling against that because he, he feels those changes happening to him and he's, you know, kind of trying to fight against it. He doesn't want Nickel to win, essentially. Mm -hmm. He wants to stay himself and get through it. Um, so I'm not going to say too much about his time there. We do get flash forwards through the book um, that take place um, in like the 80s and then the 90s and even close to the present day. Um, and in the present day, we find out that Nickel has been um, abandoned. Um, it's not being used anymore, but there's a team of archaeological students or archaeology students who are essentially like practicing excavation on the grounds and they start finding things like they find an unmarked burial ground. Um, so some of this stuff starts coming back and prompts kind of a reckoning in the in the flash forward in the present day timeline. Um, and this was based on a real place, wasn't it? It is, and that is exactly what I was gonna say next. Um, so whether you read the book or listen to the audio, the, the narrator on the audio is phenomenal, by the way. Um, there is a little afterward about um, Whitehead's research for this. 
So the, the archaeology students and the reform school, that's a, a true story. The um, school had a different name and I did not write down what the actual place was called. Um, but there were archaeology students that were excavating on the grounds of this former reform school and made all of these discoveries. So he did a lot of research about that school and also talked a lot to folks who had in, experienced incarceration, um, including one man who was in solitary confinement for over 20 years, um, who talked about that. And um, some of that, like there are a couple of quotes that he just puts right back into the book. Um, that are really powerful moments. Um, and then you find out afterward that they're based on um, real okay. reporting and real people. Um, so it's definitely a tough read in places. Um, like it's heavy, it's a heavy book, um, but it's not, um, it manages to do that without being preachy, um, without being like sledgehammery, um, like he doesn't have to tell you that all of these matter of fact things that he's putting in front of you are terrible and awful and shouldn't ever have existed. Like he trusts you to figure that out on your yeah. own, um, which of course you do because it's horrific. Um, but it's really just an excellent, excellent book um, that I highly recommend. Um, if you liked Underground Railroad, this is a much more current story, but um, he's a great storyteller and a wonderful writer. And yeah, I'm going to have to find like all of his other books now and read them because I loved it. It so sounds much. like it would be a good companion if you wanted to pair it with a nonfiction with mm -hmm. Just Mercy that I yeah. read and talked about a couple weeks ago. So absolutely. Because um, yeah. kind of a very similar theme and mm -hmm. just like it's jaw dropping some of the things you read about that really happen. Yeah. yeah. I think it would make a, a really good book discussion mm -hmm. choice as well. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff in there to talk about. Um, I can see places where people would have different opinions about what's going on. And I think that would be a really good discussion to have. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Cool. Um, any other thoughts before we wrap up claire no i think i'm good so okay excellent um so we will be back in i believe two weeks um we're going to be doing something a little bit different next time we're going to be each bringing a list of um books that have been released in 2020 that are on our lists but we just haven't gotten there yet so we're going to see um what books we were really looking forward to that we still have to catch up with uh, I might call it my pile of shame because I have them piled up. <laughs> yeah. That I want to read just, you know, if I just had all the time in the world to read exactly. what I want to read. So. Right. Um, and I'm curious to see how much overlap there is on our lists or whether oh, there is fun. any overlap. We, we, can't, we can't divulge. Yeah. Early. It's a secret. <laughs> Yes. So we will be back in two weeks with our uh, list of shame for 2020. Um, but until then, uh, stay cool, stay dry, and happy reading. Yep. Keep reading. Right. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.